the dog's like this. Not this frosty. Right. All right. We all ready? Right? I'm set. Okay. All right. I'd like to reconvene the meeting for the St. Mary's County Board of Education for Wednesday, March 13th, 2019, and we will begin with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move approval of the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion's carried, and we will begin with Lake for board reports. All right, hello, everybody. I hope you guys are having a wonderful morning. Um, so the last event that I attended was the Superintendent Student Leadership Advisory Council, and it was a meeting with our middle school students. Um, that one was really nice because for the past um, three that we have had, they've all been for high school students. So now this one kind of brought us full circle because then we got to hear a little bit from everybody. And their biggest um, like topic of the day was transitioning and belonging. So we talked a lot about advocacy and accountability, which is what we've been talking about the entire year. But we got to hear what it meant to them from their standpoint and some of the issues that they are facing in their own schools and how they would like to um, conquer those things. We talked a lot about what it is to be a leader and how they can become leaders, how they can grow their leadership because they already are leaders if you think about it. Um, and really just getting to know all of them. It's really nice getting to push them in a, in a direction towards um, the high school level of um, the SLAC committee, which is really cool. And then also getting to see a lot of them, because a lot of them are getting ready to become high schoolers. So um, I got to see a lot of them also on the rising freshman night at Leonardtown High School, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so all of it kind of came together in a nice way. We talked a lot about, like, well, we did a lot of leadership games, demonstrations, and exercises. Um, and we had a lot of different breakout sessions to just kind of talk about what it meant to them. So it was a really cool event. Thank you. I went to the Academy of Visual and Performing Arts uh, capstone project. This was held at the St. Mary's County Arts Council. Um, it was really nice. Uh, we have so many talented students. This group presented um, their artwork and each of the students got up and they uh, they had a speak um, I have to really say they they were phenomenal at presenting uh, why they chose a certain route for their project whether it was um, talking about shading or a certain artist or a certain style um, you know they gave they stood up there and they presented um, basically like a thesis, uh, very impressive. Um, and the artwork was amazing. Um, it, it just, like I said, just so much talented, talent in this area, uh, you know, with these students. So good luck to all them. I got to speak to them, kind of find out where they would like to go. One person was interested in photography. Some others, you know, are interested in maybe pursuing a different career, but um, they said that they, you know, still will enjoy their artwork and be able to fall back on it, even to, you know, gain a little extra income for putting themselves through college. So it was a, it was a great evening. Uh, I attended the um, Retirement Teachers uh, Association brunch at the Forest Center, and doc, Dr. Smith was the keynote speaker. Uh, I want to compliment the uh, culinary students at the uh, Forest Center. As usual, uh, a great uh, a brunch. And uh, I'll let Dr. Smith embellish on uh, what he uh, what he talked about. Also uh, attended the uh, joint session of the NAACP meeting that was held uh, Monday with Mrs. Bailey, and uh, the, the general uh, focus was on how can we get more diverse teachers into the school system. It's quite an interesting discussion about recruiting and uh, training and uh, working with a lot of the local colleges and also uh, some of the issues that we had or problems we had in recruiting within the state and there's some I thought some good suggestions on how we might recruit uh, minority uh, teachers uh, from other states thank you Let's see, uh, a week ago Monday we had our monthly uh, school safety advisory board meeting. The focus of this meeting was in the Safe to Learn Schools Act, there's a lot of definitions 
of different things that are laid out, but they're not necessarily defined. <laughs> so um, that is up to the governor's subcabinet and us. So the majority of that meeting took place with us kind of hashing out definitions on um, the use of force in the schools and what that's going to be defined as. And then what complements that is what reporting, what incidents would need to be reported back to the Maryland Center for School Safety and then ultimately the legislature. Uh, the definition of a school security employee, the definition of a school safety coordinator, and then along with that, who should be identified within the schools to receive the uh, school resource officer training because it's not just going, it, it, excuse me, it's not just limited to an actual SRO. There are other individuals within the school that could go through the training in order to get the framework but then not necessarily have the same uh, police officer rights as a at full SRO, but you would still be eligible to uh, obtain the training. Then also what the, uh, I guess what the working responsibilities should be of the mental health coordinator at a minimum so the school systems could add additional responsibilities but just baseline for them. And then um, also what the definition is of a critical incident in the school. So that, that was the bulk of our two hour meeting. And you know, keep in mind we have people from various groups throughout the state um, from SROs to sheriffs to mental health people from University of Maryland uh, you know there's a wide variety so it was a it was a pretty active discussion in order to make sure that these definitions encompass everything and kind of meet everyone's needs so with that I will pass it on to Mary you might have a short report because your computer's not working. <laughs> that's right. That's correct. Um, my Quick from memory. <laughs> my computer is on the blanks, and I want to talk about the um, Start Your Engine program, which was held at Benjamin Banneker Elementary School, and it was sponsored by the Food, Foods and Nutrition Services Department at SMCPS. And the purpose was to encourage students to fuel their mind so that they can be better learners, pay more attention. Uh, if you have a healthy breakfast, it will avoid a lot of discipline issues and students are ready to learn. Three community members bought their uh, race cars to school, so when the students got off the buses, the race cars were there. There were three race cars and I wanted to thank the three participants who bought their race cars, which is on my computer and <laughs> locked right now. <laughs> And it, it was a, a wonderful opportunity, and I want to thank all the people in food services who did a lot of work to make that program happen. Uh, parents need to know that they can still fill out the form for a free and reduced lunch at any time because your financial situation might change. Um, don't think you don't qualify, just fill it out anyway, and within a few days, we'll let you know if your child qualifies for a free lunch. Free um, or reduced price meal. So the lunch that I had was yogurt with um, granola, strawberries and blueberries, uh, Texas toast, which was excellent, sliced apples, milk and juice. And for reduced, that was 30 cents. And it's a dollar 55 cents for secondary schools. So fill out the form, it's online, and um, we want to make sure that all students eat and they are fueling their minds, which is their engine. So that was a great metaphor with the race cars and the muscle cars there, that how you have to fuel, fuel those in order for them to work effectively and efficiently. So thank you very much. <laughs> March 2nd was Dr. Zeus's birthday, and um, traditionally schools around the county um, ask different individuals to come in and read um, uh, for his birthday. Since it was Saturday this year, um, I went to Town Creek Elementary School on Friday the 1st and read one of my favorite Dr. Seuss stories, one that most people have never heard before, um, The Bear, the Rabbit, and the Zinnigazanaga Tree. It's, um, about a bear that's uh, about to grab hold of a rabbit and to eat him and the rabbit realizes that he is he is gone for um, but then decides if I think really fast maybe I can think my way out of it it's a wonderful story it's um, it's a great lesson and um, 
And as I've gone and read it, because it's not one that's known, uh, I find that students and teachers alike um, are interested and enjoy hearing something they've not heard before. So I appreciate the opportunity to go in and read and spend some time with our students. Um, I spent time with a lot of first graders. It was, it was great fun. And uh, so if you, if you have an opportunity to read the story, um, I encourage you to do so. It's The, the Bipolo Seed and Other Stories by Dr. <laughs> Seuss. See, you got up early. They made me read Fox on Socks. <laughs> <laughs> I have my own book. I take it with me. It's <laughs> like, seriously? I'll start where we started. Uh, Ms. Meadows, thank you very much. The middle school Slack meeting was really, was really wonderful. Um, and it was wonderful because you were there modeling for, uh, as well as uh, Caitlin, we're modeling for our middle school kids. And I think that that's incredibly important that our middle school students see high school students and recognize um, for some of them there's a great deal there's going to be a great deal of maturation that happens from sixth grade to twelfth grade and to, to, to have it uh, led by by you and Caitlin was really quite wonderful um, let's see I went to all enjoyed all of those that uh, that have that have spoken um, the retiree meeting was really was really wonderful it's, it's great to see that St. Mary's County Public Schools and I'm sure it's probably this way in other systems as well but I'm we're probably better uh, that all of our retirees really do come together as a community and they they do meet several times and they do have brunch and they do interact and they continue to serve the community to serve and support one another through that entire journey journey post retirement as i reminded them i start my 29th year next year and so you know save me a seat um <laughs> It, lo it, it looks like when after somebody retires, it's amazing. It's so it's as though they they they're suddenly rejuvenated and and they're full of joy and they have great stories of their travels. They age backwards. They age backwards. <laughs> they really do. And um, it was it was really great presenting to all of them. Um, I do want to put a plug in for the last rising freshman night. And again, back to Lake Miss <laughs> Meadows. Thank you very much for being there. Each one of the schools does indeed have students come back and act as chaperones and uh, representatives for the particular academies to talk about their experiences in school because we find that eighth grade students listen to high school students much more than they do 52 year old men so um, that was really great and so uh, we have our last rising freshman orientation night. so if you haven't been able to catch the show at Leonardtown or at Great Mills the show goes on at Chopticon tomorrow night and it begins at 6. Um, I want to end with um, two things. Uh, first of all, we are coming up on a very difficult time in St. Mary's County Public Schools next week. Um, on March 20th will be the one year mark of the tragic events at Great Mills High School. And so um, I do want to inform you, inform the board, and inform the public about what our plans are for that particular day. Uh, that particular day, the students and staff at Great Mills High School will have an abbreviated schedule. So they will go through the first five periods of their day, they will end and go to lunch, and then they will conclude their, their day. We're hoping for as much normalcy as we may be able to have through the first five periods of the day. Uh, we are pushing in a great deal of um, support both with uh, counselors and social workers, and we have the, the, the um, comfort dogs, the therapy dogs will be there. Um, but that day is for students and staff at the school. The campus will be, for all intents and purposes, closed to all others. There will be no press, there will be no visitors. Um, it really is a day for them to, 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 to be together with one another. That being said, we recognize how important it is to uh, commemorate, to remember, and to celebrate uh, Jalen Willie. So two days later, on March 22nd, there is going to be a vigil of remembrance at 7 p.m. at Chancellor's Run Regional Park. Um, it's, a, it's planned to provide an opportunity for the entire community to come together to remember and to share and to uh, truly um, uh, remember Miss um, Willie. Um, all are welcome. There will be um, representatives from the school system and from all other agencies that responded that day. 
um, there will be there will be speakers and an opportunity for all of us just to 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 really focus on what makes us um, connected to one another. So uh, I ask that um, everybody viewing and everybody uh, in in the community recognize that that Wednesday is going to be a really challenging day for Great Mills High School is, is at the center of it, the student and staff are at the center of it, but across the entire school community and across the larger community, that's gonna be a day where everybody um, really needs to be quite aware of one another and support one another. And so I, I ask that, um, that you, you please uh, keep all of us in your hope and, and hearts, and uh, I am sure that um, uh, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a really I know that we have the support in place to help us get through the day. And I do believe that the Friday event um, will be most appropriate in the way that we remember. So um, with that, I will conclude. I know that we have several students here for a presentation, um, and I look forward to it. You're going to have uh, to sit through a couple of action items, um, but then we're going to really focus on the uh, Forest Center. And I'll end with, we do have um, Three, three fantastic students. I'm going to call out one ahead of time, Gabe Gutierrez, uh, who's in the Teachers Academy of Maryland program because I did go to the PAC meeting last Friday with Melissa Chu and Dr. Jana Thompson from St. Mary's College. And it ties into the, you know, how do we recruit? How do we have a diverse teaching staff? We inspire our, our kids early on. We model for them. We role model for them what we want to see in our teachers and we hopefully uh, light that spark. And so, Gabe, I, I look forward to you sharing how your spark has been lit um, when we talk and present about the, the, the Forest Center in particular. And with that, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, and we have one public comment. Is that yes, true? we do. Okay. Um, Forest Rathbone. Okay, let's see. I will read my statement. The board welcomes public input on policies and issues affecting our schools. We take this time to listen and consider, but not to comment. This is not the appropriate forum for negative comments or criticisms of individual staff or students. Concerns about individual staff members that cannot be resolved at the level closest to the situation should be directed to the superintendent. We will not permit comments criticizing staff or students since it is outside the scope of public comment. Please keep in mind that the board sits as an appellate body in both student and employee appeals, so we cannot have comment on or have prior knowledge of a case that would influence our ability to deliberate. To maintain the ability of the board to render a fair and unbiased decision, comments regarding individual student or personnel issues cannot be presented. Speakers must sign in at the beginning of the meeting. Public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker, and you may not yield your time to someone else. And if you have any written statements, if you give them to Kathy, she will um, make sure that we receive them. Your turn. Dr. Smith, board members, and members of the audience, thank you very much. I'm DeForest Rathbone. I've been active in the parents' anti-drug movement for a long, long time, and currently am active on the health department's behavioral health committee. And in that committee, uh, we, we see the uh, reports from the school studies showing that there's still a major problem with drug use among the kids. I think the statistic is that about 18% claim they're still using marijuana regularly. And of course, marijuana is causing all kinds of problems. Now, Dr. Brewster and her staff at the health department have put together a marvelous uh, online course uh, based on scientific evidence on how best to address this opioid, opioid crisis, which is fed by uh, the early introduction and addiction of children to drugs. So we appreciate uh, what you've done so far, and, uh, and especially uh, Mike Wyatt and his efforts to keep the schools safe. But we're hearing still reports from kids who are terrified of bullying in the schools. One of the latest reports was that they, they're afraid to go to school. Now that's not general, but there's a lot of them like that, and it's causing a lot of stress. Um, so what we've done is uh, there's a lot of outside influences that are complicating your job, part of which is to assure the safety and, and health of the kids in the schools. And this, this new course tells what we need to do, what's caused it, what we need to do. And this handout that I prepared for the board for each of you has a link in it to that course. So I urge each of you to take uh, a look at that link. It's a, it, it takes a while to go through it, but it's comprehensive and very instructive. But the bottom line is we need to better be able to detect and treat kids 
that are currently on drugs to prevent it from getting worse. Um, be glad to answer any questions you want, but the, the, the details on this are all within the, the little handout I've got. I hope you take a look at it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, next is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion for approval of the consent agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. First on the action item is Mr. Hartwick, and this is for the uh, technical qualifications. On HR repairs. He's on his game today. He's he on is. his game. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Blake started. This week. <laughs> it's my fault. I take full responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one who can never see. <laughs> okay. Good morning, board members. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Harley. Um, as I begin this presentation, I'd like to uh, acknowledge a couple people. Uh, my two project coordinators are here that are going to be responsible for these two projects. The first is uh, Paola Laino. Uh, she will be running the uh, Hollywood Elementary project. And Mr. Todd Whitlock, uh, who will be running the Park Hall uh, project. Uh, both have worked diligently on preparing bid documents uh, and uh, on this pre-qualification process. Uh, our purpose today is to ask for your approval of the contractors that we have deemed uh, to be capable to serve as prime contractors uh, for these projects. Um, so, by way of background, uh, we chose to use the multi-step procurement method, which we have used on uh, three previous occasions. This will be our fourth. Uh, it's, a, it's a process where we uh, essentially ask for technical qualifications first. We evaluate those qualifications, uh, and we establish uh, specific requirements for experience, expertise, uh, we want to know some financial information uh, and uh, understanding of the project, but also we ask for uh, their experience in phasing. Uh, we ask for their history of meeting MBE goals. Uh, the, these projects will have 11 percent MBE uh, participation. Um, uh, and then we basically evaluate those uh, on a pass-fail uh, basis. And then only the, the contractors or potential bidders that we deem to be uh, pre-qualified are allowed to submit price bids at the second step in this process. And contract award is based on the low bid. Uh, again, uh, we've used it three previous times, and we believe we've been well served by that by that process. So, um, just as a little more background, uh, we did uh, advertise an email and marketplace on February first, two thousand nineteen, for this pre-qualification process. Uh, as usual, we had a large number of. Uh, contractors and suppliers that received the notification, uh, eight contractors actually requested uh, pre-qualification packages. I will say that, uh, as many of you know, this is a very tight bidding market. And so in addition to uh, advertising on email and marketplace, we reached out to our consultants to see if there were some firms uh, that would be interested. Unfortunately, um, those, those firms, uh, because of workload uh, and the travel distance to these jobs, uh, declined to participate in the pre-qualification process. Nevertheless, we had five contractors submit uh, the pre-qualification packages. 
Uh, we're pleased by that number. Uh, and I'm going to just quickly run through the profile of each. Uh, and I will say that I know each firm uh, on this list. Uh, the first one uh, you all know is um, Shiable Construction. Uh, they've done a large number of projects for us. I think it's over 14 now. Uh, they've done not only work for us, but Calvert County Public Schools, uh, a variety of public schools and, um, in Virginia as well. Uh, and that firm has really grown over the years. Uh, and you can see that uh, their annual uh, contracts have increased and they currently have $197,000 under contract. Um, one of the things we do ask for is a letter of surety from the surety company. So they tell us upfront uh, what their current bonding capacity is as it relates to the uh, potential project that they may be awarded. Second firm, uh, also well known to me, is Tuckman Barbie Construction. Uh, they're located in Upper Marlboro. Uh, they've been around since 1946. They do a lot of work for uh, PG County Public Schools and Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, we've been trying to get them down. Uh, they've been on a number of projects for us in the past. But you may know that there's a contractor for uh, the library in Leonardtown adjacent to Captain Walter Francis Duke. So they're really intent on uh, increasing their uh, presence in, in Southern Maryland. Uh, their work is um, currently they have about $65 million of construction work uh, under contract. Uh, they have a very good sh surety rating, uh, plenty of capacity. The third firm is also well known to you, uh, uh, Dennis Anderson Construction Corporation. They do a lot of work for us. Uh, they, uh, for a similar project, you might recall that they did the Oakville uh, systemic renovation a number of years ago, which I think is one of our more successful uh, systemic projects. Uh, so that they also work in Calvert, Charles, and PG County. They do a lot of work for the archdiocese. They currently have about $21 million uh, under construction, so it's a little smaller firm. Uh, their surety rating is excellent. They have plenty of bonding capacity. Uh, the, the next firm, the fourth firm, is Denver Ellick. Uh, they're located in Baltimore County. Um, they do a lot of technical work uh, for the University of Maryland, uh, NIH, uh, but they've also done quite a few projects for the Baltimore County Public School System. Um, their work is usually in the 40 to $50 million range, uh, and their surety is rated at uh, A by AM best, and again, plenty of uh, bonding capacity. The final firm is W.L. Gary Company, uh, based in Washington, D.C., uh, a long-standing company, as you can see. Uh, completed a number of projects for Charles County Public Schools. They currently have, uh, they're pre-qualified for similar systemic projects at Montgomery County Public Schools and the University of Maryland. Uh, again, they're in that 40 to $50 million range of construction work annually. Uh, and again, a, a good uh, surety rating and plenty of capacity. So if we move forward, uh, in January, you gave us uh, authority to submit the construction document to DGS. We've talked to them. Uh, we're expecting their comments shortly. We'll give them a call today uh, to, to get a status. Um, and we, uh, we're hoping to bid and award this project uh, in, uh, in April. Uh, so that would allow work to begin in the summer of 2019 and to be completed by the end of summer of 2020. So uh, in, in, our, uh, in our evaluation, we believe all five firms are capable. Uh, they've shown that they have the financial and bonding capacity. They've shown that they have uh, the experience with phasing projects. Uh, and they've all shown that they have a good history of meeting uh, MBE goals. So in all, we think this is a very capable and competitive group. 
Well, does that all take a question? I have no questions for you. It's a very thorough presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Will you be uh, uh, dividing this into the two different schools and may possibly having two different groups <coughs> come in, or yeah. is this a one? That's, that's very possible. We split them out intentionally. Okay. Uh, so that it would be up to the capacity of the firm to do two if they chose to do firm, uh, or if they did not believe that they uh, had that capacity or were very interested in one over the other. Uh, that's why we split it up. Okay. The bids will also be separated in time uh, by a few days, uh, so that would be an interesting dynamic as well. All right. See who pays attention to the timeline, right? Yeah. <laughs> of, uh, per, you know, place of their bid. So, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the pre-qualifications, once they pre-qualify the five, is it strictly uh, lowest bid? Yes, sir. Uh, is there any qualifications on lowest bid, like uh, responsible bid or do you that, give them? That's the whole, I'm sorry, that's the whole idea of the pre-qualification is to make sure they're a responsible bidder. Well, what now, I'm getting at is that I've had experience where very competent contractors missed the floor. And oh, oh by the way, we were 10% lower than everybody else. And uh, they were not necessarily disqualified. They were given an opportunity to adjust their bid. Do you give that opportunity at all in your, uh, your We bidders? only give that opportunity if they've made a mistake. Otherwise, we will hold them to their bid bond. Okay. So that answers my questions on that. Uh, and you mentioned the uh, uh, surety uh, uh, issues, I think, uh, obviously, are very, very important. Um, does the, any of the contractors get credit if they've done past work for you? Is, or is it, that's just part of the pre qualification criteria? I mean, it's kind of a, uh, contact for the pre-qualification and often uh, the potential bidders will list our projects which we know very well uh, but we don't give any extra credit for it okay that's all I have thank you I have any questions thank you no questions good job thank you sir. you've answered all the questions I had thank you very much thank appreciate you. it all right and with that may I have a motion for this recommended action item I move that the Board of Education approve the pre-qualification of general contractors for the systemic HVAC renovations and roof replacements at Hollywood Elementary School and Park Hall Elementary School as presented. Do I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And next is the school safety grant budget from Mr. Wyatt and his Good morning. Good morning. So we are here jointly with you. Um, this is a good collaboration between our two departments. Um, the um, Safe to Learn Act of 2018 included $20 million that came to the capital side through the Interagency Commission on school construction. Um, they've authorized the first 10 million of the 20 million that they um, have to authorize. So that was covered under House Bill 1783. Um, the grant allows for security improvements, um, including but not limited to securing lockable classroom doors, areas of safe refuge, surveillance and security technology for school and monitoring purposes. Um, our allotment um, for that, uh, that grant out of the first 10 million was 182,000. Um, and it was approved by the um, Interagency Commission on February 21st. It did require a local matching grant, which we are taking that out of the money that we have, the, the, the roughly $2 million that we have. Um, and it was based on our cost share. When we looked at it, um, originally we thought it was gonna be in the 130,000 range, but once we put the actual projects in, it's 165,000 of the local match. Um, the state has approved um, the grant, so I'm gonna let Mr. Um, why not talk about what we're going to do with the money? Right. Thank you, Ms. Howe. So again, this is one of the formula-based grants uh, that comes out of the Safe to Learn Act. 
Um, and we're just using this to continue the process that we presented on several times to the board before regarding all of our physical security enhancements. So specifically, we're going to focus uh, this project, given the, uh, you know, the, the funding that was available, on two schools. So it would be Leonardtown High School and Choptakine High School, building up the security vestibules for those, uh, finishing out the ballistic laminate <coughs> uh, uh, for the entire building, uh, all four sides of the building, as well as the electronic door monitoring systems. Uh, we're moving very uh, quickly on those as well. In fact, uh, Ms. Cosner, we just opened the bids on the electronic door monitoring systems. We'll be bringing those to you probably at the next board meeting or at the one that follows that. So um, we are continuing to move as fast and as furious as we can on all this to get this done. And as Ms. Howe said, I greatly appreciate all of their help because this does not happen in a vacuum. So. So what we have before you today is to approve the grant. Um, what we need to do is to increase our capital budget um, with the, the county. So to do that, we would get you to approve the grant and then that grant would go forward to the county commissioners for their approval so that we can then include it on the CIP project list. Okay. Um, I just had one question. I'm not sure if this is something that they can answer or something that you can answer. Um, what does it mean by a local match is for the money that's allotted there? Is that part of the grant or is it coming from a local fund? So the, the interagency committee, when they established this, what they said was they were going to, by formula, give us $182,000. To get the $182,000, we had to match what is a called a cost share formula. So um, they participate at 58%. We pay the remainder of it. So when you look at the total value of the projects, for instance, Choptecon High School is $190,020. They're paying $100,212, our match, which is 47%. Um, is 89,808. So we have to put money forward to share in the process and the, and the project. So that's where we get the local match of 165. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. I have no questions, but thank you for the continual update of how you're keeping our students safe through the physical, you know, physically through the buildings. And um, like I said, you, I mean, you're, you're, you know, making this money work and stretching it as, as best you can. So thank you. Uh, the only question I have is on the uh, safety security station. Is that the vestibule? Yes, sir. That would be at the, at the vestibule. At, at yes, the sir. Vestibule. It's not any dedicated other station other than that. Okay. Right. That's all I have. Thank yeah. you. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. So the safety and security station will be similar to Great Mills, where exactly. you have a safety. So could you explain <clears throat> that to the citizens who are listening who have not seen that? What does that look like, and what will they entail when they go into sure, a school? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for the question. So it, by design, it's, it's, we're actually in, enhancing all the processes, the building blocks, if you will, that we put in place over the years. Um, you know, since we, uh, for many years now, we've been putting security vestibules uh, in every building. Uh, we have two sites now that need to require additional build out, but for the majority of the schools, we have a, a containment area in the front of the building where you enter the building. There's a second area of doors that, and then a side door that brings you into the main office area where you're, you see a building access management system. What we're doing now is putting a dedicated security person. Uh, the plan is to put an unarmed security officer, a school system employee there that's due diligence to visitors and access to the building all day, every day, while our children, our students are in the building. Uh, that security vestibule is built out to be sort of a monitoring station as well for the security person who's staffing it to include uh, a full wrap of the security camera surveillance systems for the exteriors of the building, the access points, those kinds of things, as well as this exterior door monitoring system which is going to have uh, it's an alarm system, basically, uh, where it notifies if an exterior ground level door has been opened or breached that we don't know about. And from there, they're able to dispatch via our campus radio communications to the area of the building to see what's happening with that door, what activity, to make sure that it's not something that we need to be concerned about, those kinds of things. Uh, but full vetting of the parents and others that come to the, you know, the building that day, are they truly a parent? Are they there for a stated purpose? You know, if, if need be, uh, screening packages that may be coming in, all those kinds of things. So it's, it's it truly enhancing all the pieces that we have put in place over the years and finally giving us, you know, the capability to be able to do all of those things. So will parents and citizens have to show any forms of identification to prove who yes. they are? And how is that checked? 
So you, usually with the, the uniformed officer, they'll ask them for a, some form of identification, work through that process, and if not, if they don't have identification, they'll try to work with the parent to make sure, one, that we know that this is kind of a, a, obviously a shift in change expectations, so we'll work with them and, and look at the databases of school staff to make sure that they, we, get, we meet their needs for the day, but try to ensure now that we're doing these, these identification checks and that who in the building we know exactly who they are which is quite different than going to a, a computer screen and typing in a name and no one saying, can I please see your identification card, those kinds of things. Right. It's uh, increased security. Yes, ma'am. Um, also, well, these safety and secu security stations have been in office buildings for years that you just can't walk in an office building and walk through the building freely, which our schools used to be when back then, but now we have to have this security in our schools for um, the protection of our students and staff and visitors in the school. Can you tell us what you can about the ballistic resistant window covering? Sure. If you can. Oh, absolutely. So, um, it, it, you know, you can go to several websites and, and you can search, you know, for information on ballistic resistant uh, laminates. All kinds. Of, it's a new technology that's been developed uh, where it doesn't require the replacement of actually the existing glass in a building. Uh, and it's actually a laminate film that goes over uh, areas that are considered very vulnerable to forced entry. So it, when you say ballistic, it kind of implies that it's all about uh, bulletproof glass and things like that, but truly it, it, it fortifies, it strengthens the existing glass that is there. Uh, and this laminate actually holds the glass together uh, so if someone's trying to make forced entry, you know, either by shooting a bullet through it uh, or kicking at it or, you know, taking a bat and hitting at it, it's going to hold that glass together. The concept primarily is to buy time uh, and not to revisit history, but if, you know, incidents like Sandy Hook and others where, you know, forced entry was made through breaching that glass, what that's going to do is prevent that from happening immediately where the glass collapses and someone can walk literally right through a very large pane of glass and into the building. Um, and, and there's demonstration videos on many sites that you'll see that it, sometimes it takes 10 to 15 minutes literally to tear through this laminate to make the hole big enough for them to be able to walk in and make entry into the building. <coughs> so uh, commercial industry is using this now for kind of what they, what they refer to as a smash and grab, you know, where someone would run up to a, a store window, break out the window and grab whatever on display, those kinds of things. So it has a lot of other enhancement components, but one of the most critical components that we focus on regarding uh, preventing threats from outside is to buy time. Obviously, we're calling 911 and we're waiting for the help to arrive that we know is always there for us. So. And the state is very interested. They've asked a lot of information about the research we've done because it is a very cost-effective way to, to cover a lot, large portion of a building versus mm -hmm. putting in the, the new windows that would be the same, same yeah, and Mr. Hart, we could probably fill you in more than I could, but the ballistic uh, proof glass, uh, the, the thickness of it, the weight of it, uh, would require literally reframing many of our current walls in our buildings uh, to, to be able to support the weight and capacity of it. So this is really an effective way to really enhance things and it, extremely cost effective uh, for you to be able to wrap an entire building. And Mr. Ivar, our school safety coordinator, is doing the safety assessments that you know we'll be bringing those to you and probably in late June. But they're due to the our reports due to the state in mid June, uh, according to the law. But when he's going out now, he's actually walking around the building and he's identifying those areas where there is vulnerability with that glass, measuring it, and it, making a list. And we actually we met with one of the vendors yesterday, uh, and we're going to try to get at least two buildings done over spring break. Um, it, it's really difficult to do it when the, the children are in the buildings because there's actually a caulk that goes around the bottom and we just don't want fingers kind of, you know, those kinds of things. So we're, most of this is going to be done over the summer, but as we have opportunities, we're definitely going to be moving forward with it. So. That's good. You answered my question about how you would determine which windows would need this ballistic resistant mm -hmm. covering. Yep. So you're going to do the survey and it will be done over the summer. Right. Absolutely. Thank you very much for all that you do and all the programs that you have brought to the school system to protect students. You've done so many programs. Um, dating violence, could you name some of the other ones? 
uh, dating violence, young teen driver safety. Uh, we've done opioid abuse, substance misuse for several years now. Uh, bullying prevention, cyber safety, the list goes on and on. I know so, you have done yeah. so much, and thank you very much for what you've done educating our student staff and community members mm -hmm. on welcome. safety. Your um, department is doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, your ability to move forward with this, is that dependent on the commissioners mm -hmm. signing off on this grant? Yes, ma'am. Can you do anything before they sign off on this grant? I don't think so. Um, I'll defer I asked, to Ms. McCourt, but I think we need to make sure that we have that I approval. asked because I understand there's a backlog of our grant approvals that are sitting at the commissioners that um, need their need their approval. I, I hope that they'll take this one as well as the others we've put forward and um, move on them in a timely fashion, right. like as soon as possible. Yeah, I appreciate the comment. Of, of interest to the board may be that you know, these grants, are, are they've been out since last spring. Uh, and the awards are just starting to, you know, come to us on a mm -hmm. local level. So um, there's a little bit of concern about the deadline for June 30th right. regarding the fiscal year. Uh, and I do believe the Maryland Center for School Safety is very cognizant of that, and they are considering an extension. Uh, but I don't think they've worked out the details about how that's going to work out. Yet. Well, I just know that we have um, several different things that are, are pending their approval, and, and this one especially hearing that you would like to begin some of this work um, over spring break and that that time is fast approaching yes. um, I would I would um, hope that the commissioners will be able to make time on their agenda to um, to address this as well as the other items and this grant comes with specific guidelines from the state which means it has to be completed um, and request for reimbursement by June of next year so time is of the essence on this project absolutely so. thanks very much you've answered my questions I appreciate it very much anything else no, ma'am. All right. May I have a motion? I move. Oh, sorry. Uh, I move that the Board of Education approve an acceptance of this grant and applicable budget in the amount of one hundred eighty-two thousand dollars and submittal of this budget increase to the commissioners of St. Mary's County for their approval. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you. All right. Mr. Egan. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. And I also thank them. They sat in the front row and everything. That was really, really quite nice. Thank you, uh, board members, Dr. Smith, uh, for inviting us here today. Um, we're very excited to highlight our amazing students at the Forest Center. And I have to say, it is kind of refreshing uh, sitting before you and not asking for anything today. So, <laughs> it's kind of nice uh, for a change. Just information. <clears throat> Just information. And uh, it's, a, it, it's a great opportunity to, um, you know, these young folks are, are, you know, they're why what we do you know every day uh, and that's why we're here so it's it's really uh, exciting for me to be able to talk about what we do at the Forest Center um, just a, a quick overview of the Forest Center uh, currently have uh, 23 I want to apologize for that uh, career areas or completer pathways at the Forest Center uh, so we're very excited to offer that opportunity um, that our students have and uh, they obviously gain real world experience in uh, a variety of career fields. Uh, they work with real industry tools, equipment, and technology, and uh, as you'll see in just a couple minutes, they de definitely develop marketable skills. Um, uh, one of the things that we've really done at the Forest Center with our staff is to kind of change our vision. We have the same mission as St. Mary's County Public Schools, uh, but we've changed our vision a little bit over the last few years. Um, we all know that uh, data shows that when students choose career and technical pathways, they graduate at higher rates. Um, so we're very proud that students attending the Forest Center, we've, our completion rate's been higher than 98% over the last five years. So we've been very proud of that. But we wanted to take it one step further uh, and offer what we call value-added education. So it's our goal that when students come to the Forest Center, uh, they have the opportunity to earn technical attainment, which is just a fancy way of saying, saying that they earn a real industry certification that they can use for employment right now. 
We also uh, want to offer opportunities for students to earn articulated or transcripted credit. Um, we all know that uh, college and trade schools are, are very expensive nowadays, so um, students have the opportunity to save themselves and their parents a lot of money by earning college credit while they uh, attend the Forest Center. And uh, these three folks will be able to tell you that um, our, one of our mantras is grit, and they see it all over the school, and I can see the smiles on their faces now because they hear it continually. Uh, our teachers have grit, and when we hear a student say, I can't, we always teach them the courage to, to add the word yet. Uh, we never give up. We persevere, and uh, I think that's what, that's what makes the Forest Center so successful. Uh, this is just uh, a quick um, synopsis of all the programs we have to offer at the Forest Center, our three-year and two-year programs. Um, what you see here really is a, a, a kind of a quick summary of that value-added opportunity. Uh, and there are more. They change uh, frequently in terms of the articulation agreements. So what you see there are all the colleges and universities that we do have articulation agreements with. Um, on the right, the program, those are programs that currently offer uh, real industry certifications. And we continue to work every year to add to, these, to both of these lists. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to let these three amazing young folks uh, talk a little bit about themselves, and um, we have Kennedy Morgan, who's with us from our electrical wiring program, Gabe Gutierrez from our teacher academy, and Charles Burks from our aviation technology program. Um, and they've been practicing, so uh, I'm going to let these folks <laughs> tell you a little bit about themselves and some of their accomplishments. My name is Kennedy Morgan. I'm a second year student in electrical wiring, and I'd like to start off by saying we can earn not only high school credits, but we also learn or er, we also earn for um, for certifications. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, two of which are NCCER, and one is core curriculum, so it's introduction to the trade. And then the second one is electrical level one, so it's actually you actually get to learn about electrical work and the first one is mainly like hand tools and power tools we also earn OSHA 10 hour safety training and this is more um, on the job so you know how to be safe with everything and all the safety hazards and the final one is CPR and first aid and that's a really valuable one in the trade because um, People get hurt all the time, like there's a whole bunch of dangerous items and it's really common to get hurt in the trade. Um, but the first three, OSHA 10 and NCCER, are good for life and the only one you need to update is CPR and first aid. And there's three main electrical work you can go into and we mainly learn residential but you can also learn commercial and industrial. And I mainly focus on industrial motor controls. And a few weeks ago, a company named Platform Aerospace came into our career center to tour not only my program, but a lot of other programs to see our students. And they saw a couple of my projects in the shop and they were really interested in me. So we later, about two weeks ago, went on a field trip to their facility and they were really interested in me so they offered me an apprenticeship for not only next year but this summer so I'll start as soon as school lets out and I'll work during summer and then I'll continue into senior year because now I'm a junior so I'll be a third year technically next year at Tech Center but instead of going to Tech Center every day I'll go straight to work and I also get paid, so that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> but yeah, that it really affected my or what career I want to choose because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I was going in just to like be an electrician because my brother was one and I was interested in it. And everyone says you can't do it because you're a girl, but mm -hmm. I obviously proved them wrong. So, but um, yeah, I think it'll really affect my life and how I choose my career so thank you thank you 
Uh, hello, I'm Charles Burks. I'm a three-year aviation completer. Uh, so I'd say that my program has been very helpful, even if you're not going to go into like the aviation field after school. So the first year we started out with just using like basic tools and precision measuring. So I didn't really know how to do any of that, and now that's something I could take to anything else really, because that's something that's pretty standard across like all industries. Uh, additionally, we got a lot of, the first year we built these uh, UAS Zaggies, so that gave us a little experience building uh, drones. Uh, we were able to get out there and fly them, so that was very helpful for us, especially like uh, aviation side. That's something that's becoming more and more uh, de developed every day. Um, so sophomore year, we wor worked more on like actual like hard um, aviation stuff like um, riveting uh, and that type of thing. And we actually transitioned, we're doing like a UAS program right now, so we'll actually earn like a safety certification so that we will be certified to fly uh, unmanned aerial systems um, in that. I additionally, I was able to earn my CPR, um, yeah, my CPR certification, so that's also something I could take to another industry if I wanted to. So I'm not, uh, that's especially what I like about my program and a lot of the programs that are offered. Uh, they're not, you, just because you're taking aviation, you're not locked into taking aviation, you're able to change if you really wanted to uh, because just how, how, how valuable those skills are. Um, additionally, I'm pretty heavily involved in Skills USA, which is a national organization that's actually present at uh, the Forest Center. So I'm the state president for Skills USA Maryland, uh, and I was able to attend nationals uh, twice, and I'll be going back in June, and uh, I've helped to create uh, our state conference and our fall leadership conference uh, twice now. Oh, one more thing. I'm going to brag on on uh, on Charles a little bit. Charles uh, has made an application to West Point, and he's waiting to hear right now from West Point. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed for mm -hmm. uh, for Charles. So we're very proud of him. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Gabriel. Um, I'm in the Teacher Academy, which is a two-year program. Um, that's where do I start? So uh, going back to what you said about the spark, growing up, I didn't really know that there was such thing as a male teacher because um, it wasn't until like the eighth grade where I saw like my first like male teacher. I'm like, whoa, like that's the thing. <laughs> 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 um, and then it was also in the, so growing up, I sort of like liked teaching, like I not, not necessarily like being up in front of everybody, but helping uh, um, others sort of understand what was being taught. Um, so I didn't really know that I wanted to pursue a career in teaching um, until the eighth grade. Um, I, um, when I moved to Kentucky, um, there was a teacher, her name was Miss Corda. Um, she would share her passion, like why she wanted to, and that sort of like, oh, like I want to do that. I want to be that person that inspires others and helps others learn. And then when I moved to Maryland, um, there was, I learned about the Teacher Academy my freshman year. And I'm like, yep, that's something I want to do. So. Because of that, I sort of um, learned more about teaching, um, how to do it. Um, it offers an internship, which currently I'm at Leonardtown Middle School, um, teaching a seventh grade science classroom. Um, and then so the Teacher Academy, um, it offers two certifications. Uh, right now, I'm certified to be a peer professional when I graduate, and then also uh, the first aid and uh, CPR certification. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, just kind of wanted to also show the next level. Uh, these are all students and what they're doing currently. These are a couple of students who have uh, worked their way through the Forest Center. Michael was the class of 2010 production engineering, and he is now working as uh, engineering technician and drafter designer. Matthew was the class of 2017 production engineering, um, participated in cooperative vocational training. Um, and is currently working as a machinist um, at the facility on Webster Field. And these young men, uh, we're proud to say, are uh, Beverly Dahlstrom's two sons. So uh, we really value, I think you'll find a lot of folks in the system. Uh, I know a lot of folks at the Forest Center there. Uh, we make sure we find a way for our young, our children even to go through these programs. So it's really valuable. Um, and with that, if uh, anyone has any questions. Well, I don't have any questions for you, but I have to say this is really, really cool. 
um, I've never seen anything like this. So to have programs and like hearing what you guys have talked about and accomplished at this age is really, really awesome. Um, a lot of like the qualifications you guys already have are some things that I've heard adults talking about them just now getting to. So you guys should be very proud of yourselves and I hope that you guys continue to spread, you know, um, your own experiences and you know get more people to join because I hope this is a program that continues to grow and flourish because you guys are amazing. Thank you. Well, I have to say, Kennedy, congratulations to you on already uh, procuring a job. <laughs> that is amazing. I am so glad that they have, I don't know, it's still called work study or, you know, um, out there. That is great. So you're already on your way through your apprenticeship program. Do you know how long uh, it, how many years it is for the apprenticeship for an uh, electrician? I'm not sure how long it is, but if they want to keep me after the apprenticeship, then they'll pull me into the company and then I'll start working for them full time. Very good. Well, good luck with that and congratulations. Thank you. And uh, uh, Charles, um, congratulations on being the state representative. I know that the Skills USA is so important um, and having that leadership role. Um, I know will play well on your application at West Point. So, um, you know, keep us updated on that and, you know, how you make out. And then, um, I'm sorry, I've, Gabe. Uh, Gabe. Gabe. Um, that's pretty cool that you had that spark, that, I guess, light bulb that went off. Um, you're going to make an amazing teacher, um, and those students are going to love having you, you know, keep the enthusiasm up. And as you know, Mr. Uh, Egan, that, um, you know, uh, Zachariah went through the uh, networking program and he is drawing extremely well with his uh, IT networking um, or cybersecurity. So he came out of um, the tech center with a certification and was able to go, you know, start I guess you would say like a lower job, you know, level job, but he still was uh, marketable, you know, coming out of school. So, um, and he has done fantastic. He really enjoys what he's doing. So, you know, great programs there. Um, and also I have to give a plug for case programs and some on the back committee. Mm -hmm. um, you know that's a great program that's with agriculture so if you're interested in agriculture um, there's so many different aspects of that whether you're going into you want to be a veterinarian for livestock or for dogs and cats or if you want to you know look at nur you know nutrition nourishment how people farm plants etc that's a good program to look at so all right well um one of the things that came to mind in preparing our students for careers is um, what careers are really in demand now? And I've always argued to anybody that would listen to me is try to get into, into a profession where there's going to be demand for your skill sets. And uh, the, uh, I can recall friends that got a degree in political science and that they had either <coughs> had to become a lawyer uh, or maybe an accountant or something like that. <laughs> uh, no, no pun here. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, compliment uh, the program. Uh, Kennedy, of course, you know, uh, in the trades, the electrical uh, electricians are in great demand. Um, Gabe, of course, we know. You know we're a shortage of teachers right now and uh, it would seem to me that in the next 30 years you're not going to have any trouble finding work and uh, Charles um, my heart is in aviation I would have been an airline captain had I not been able to pass the physical I got all my ratings uh, Uncle Sam paid for them in the GI Bill I'm a flight instructor commercial pilot and uh, I've got thousands and thousands of flight hours. And that is a great profession right now. Uh, if you wanted to be an airline, go to, let's say, West Point, get your, uh, uh, 
your flight background in uh, you could go in with the airlines right now there's such a shortage of pilots that the airlines are going like they did back 50 years ago it's all you needed was a college degree and 200 hours and they would pick you up and train you and these pilots would be making really big dollars down the road so I just want to compliment you all it seems to me like the three uh, career uh, tracks that you're taking right now are uh, are professions that are in great demand. Thank you, Mike. For Thank you. That's all right. I think the opportunities that are provided through the Tech Center are probably unmatched at other uh, counties throughout the state. Uh, it, the, with the combination of the programs that are offered, plus with the um, industries that are down here, I think it's it's a it's a perfect match. And just in talking to other board members and you know other people from different parts not everyone has this so congratulations to the three of you I mean I, I think it's fabulous I, your speeches were great so good job and uh, you know best of luck and I want to say something to all three of you congratulations to Kennedy on your paid internship that's excellent and even if it wasn't a paid internship, there are great opportunities for there, there for you to learn and for future employment in the future. So congratulations on that. When I was in high school, I studied business college preparatory. So I was able to, in my senior year, go to school a week and then work a week. And the teacher would just flip it for the students so she would teach the same lesson twice. And it was a paid internship. So that worked um, well to me, for me. And I'm glad that you chose a quote, non-traditional field that women have not usually gone in and the world is changing. And you can be anything you want to be. You, you don't have to be defined by gender. It's like a story that I read to the students called Amazing Grace about a girl, Grace, who wanted to play the role of Peter Pan. And they said, you can't be Peter Pan, that's a boy. But Grace studied, she practiced, and she got the role in the school play to be Peter Pan. And as you know, the person who originally played Peter Pan was a woman anyway. So you can be anything you wanna be, and I wanna thank you for that. Charles, um, aviation technology, working with unmanned systems and drones, and you are the state president for Skills USA. That's a great accomplishment, and that's great to St. Mary's County that you're doing that. And congratulations and best wishes on getting into West Point. I'll say congratulations in advance. Um, Gabe, uh, thank you for considering teaching that this, that's one of the board goals, um, to recruit males, especially in the elementary schools, because there's a shortage of males there, and our students need uh, male role models, and we try to grow our own teachers. So thank you for considering that. Um, and your internship at Leonardtown, that's phenomenal. So you'll get the perspective of not being a student, as you are, but being in the role of a teacher. So that's very admirable. So um, thank you, Mr. Egan, for being the leader there. Your leadership trickles down to everybody else and you set the tone for the school and the high expectations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I love the Tech Center and the 23 programs that you have. I really like the student can get their certifications and they can work hard at it and they can go right to work and probably in many cases where they work, they will pay their way to college because they see a value employee. So as many opportunities and thank you three students for coming here and present. You did an excellent job presenting. You spoke very well, you look very well and you are very professional. So thank you very much. Good luck to all three of you. Um, I hope truly that you will um, inspire others as you've certainly inspired us and as you've been inspired by others. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that you can give back to our students. Um, there are so many people in the community who don't understand the 
um, what's offered at the tech center and the value that if you get into one program, the skills um, that you learn there really translate across many different fields and many different opportunities. Um, you are our best ambassadors to go out and make sure that others understand. Kennedy, certainly, to let, um, to let young girls understand they can do whatever they want to. And they need not listen to anybody who tells them no. Um, so uh, congratulations on your future. It looks like it's going to be very bright. Mr. Egan, I hope that you will continue to talk um, uh, anywhere and everywhere that you can to explain exactly what goes on at the Tech Center and the um, incredible program, programs that are offered there. I think one of the neat things about going into all of our schools is each one has its own personality. And that comes from the staff, but it also comes from the students. And one of the things I always witness when I'm in the Tech Center <coughs> is the engagement and excitement that the students universally show. They're so proud of what they're doing. They're so excited about them, um, what they're doing. And they're really happy to, um, to, to showcase that in so many different ways. I love the fact that the Chamber of Commerce State of the Schools was offered at the Tech Center because I think that was a real eye-opening experience for the individuals from the Chamber um, to, to actually go in and see with their own eyes the many different programs that you have and the exhibits that you had um, in the front atrium uh, for everyone to, to see and experience. And I know that uh, different folks that I talk to are really um, interested in perhaps coming for a tour of the building so that they can see not just um, those external spaces but really um, into the heart of the building and understand exactly what we do offer. We're very fortunate to have the number of partners that we do um, in the various industries who are um, willing and able to share not only their expertise but the tools they use so that students come out using um, that which is most current. And that's important because walking into a job um, can be an overwhelming experience. But to um, already have a familiarity with what you're about to enter uh, really puts you in a good place um, for, for going forward. So thank you for being here today and for sharing what you have. Um, congratulations and good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. And I want to say one thing. I was at Leonardtown Elementary School reading to students, and I saw a busload of your dental assistant students coming in, and I was so proud and excited. I went back in the school with them to see what they were doing. And your students give back to the community. They were in the kindergarten class, and each student had a uh, like packet. They had coloring books in it. They had dental floss. They had handouts. They talked about healthy nutrition. They showed the students how to floss correctly, how to brush correctly, and they read stories to them. It was wonderful how they were giving back to the community and, sh and sharing their knowledge and with the students. So your students are a lot of places around the county, and I want to thank you for what they are doing. This is just a small example of what's done at the Forest Center. So thank you all. I think the future looks bright. Th th thank you for mentioning that, Mrs. Washington. You know, one of the things I say is uh, our programs uh, uh, go as the teachers go, and, and our, our staff is amazing. And I really see my job is to just get the amazing teachers what they need to do their job. And I, you know, I, I think Dr. Smith will tell you, I'm not one to be out in the forefront. I'd rather, I'd rather sit back and, you know, when things are going really well, you know, those teachers are doing amazing jobs. Uh, when things aren't going well, um, then I need to do a better job. So, uh, but our staff is incredible. Um, so we're blessed. And I think all of these folks here will tell you that um, uh, they develop that spark and that passion every day. So, I'm, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the teachers and the staff at that building because they're, they're second to none. Yeah, and and so that's Mr. Town, mm -hmm. Mr. Skinner, and Miss Chu. You know, they are. You know, they're as they're as fantastic as their students who come before us. Yep. Um, you, the power of not yet, adding yet to I can't is is quintessential. You definitely model that perseverance at the school. Um, you are value added when we will be engaged in budget conversations where we'll be talking about big money and we'll be having a whole bunch of people making comments and statements and I ask anyone before they consider 
uh, fully funding education come out and see what the investment yields because it's not an expense it's an investment mm -hmm. and you know you are a, a fantastic testament to what's being done within our school so just thank you very much you all did a really 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 good job thank you thank you I have, I have two quick things. Oh, sure. So when we were talking on Monday at the at the meeting, at the NAACP meeting about career day and how some of the elementary schools struggle to fill their career day slots. Right. Ta-da. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, at, even I, at the elementary school. In level, fact, we're, yes. I'm scheduled to go to Carver for uh, for yes. theirs. Okay. So already. So we're, With students. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. And then my second, and I showed Dr. Smith the article last week when we were sitting in the budget work session for the county commissioners, is that there's a school, there's a tech school up in Pennsylvania, and up there it's, it, you know, it's done by districts, so all of the districts feed into like one big school, and what they do is that they do, you know how you see all the sports, you know, where they all line up with the colleges about where they sign to? Well, this school did it for, for their students who had jobs or internships, so they had the same, you know, mm -hmm. You know, focus, and focus and recognition for, for industry, for that, industry we have for that, that they did for athletics. So that's just a little, little thought. A little thought. Well, yeah. So we have the <laughs> newspaper person here. Yeah, so keep right. that in mind. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's really so. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your patience this morning. All right. Dr. Montgomery and Dr. Jaffers. So as they're settling in, you're giving me time Mr. to make sure Egan I can is pull leaving. It up. Your 11th slide. <laughs> Mr. Egan did <laughs> reference the fact that you have a 98 point something completion rate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the the, the tech center never gives up. They have a 98 percent completion rate, and and so how does that translate into other schools? That's going to be the presentation today because you're going to hear a little bit about how our on-time graduation rate. Uh, is for the 2018 years and so as you leave thank you very much the number that's going to be presented is predicated on the work that you and your teachers do thank you thanks all right go back to school <laughs> see you later Dr. Montgomery, we're going to come down here and practice. <laughs> I'm telling you, wait, wait, no, I got it's it. Still I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. That you had a list for me this morning. So. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Jaffers and I are uh, pretty excited to present our four-year graduation um, rate data to you for the class of 2018. Um, and we, we collect a lot of data on kids from the time they, sometimes from the time they're born, you know, all the way up through grade 12. We collect attendance data, we collect discipline data, we collect achievement data along the way. But arguably, um, the greatest measure of success comes with our graduation rate data and, and how well we move kids on. And it was really a great program that a uh, great presentation that um, Mr. Egan and his students did because we are really proud of the work that they do but the end result you know this is what we're about to talk about and before I do the great reveal of what our graduation rate is this year I'm going to have Dr. Jaffers dazzle you with Jesus. the formula, the formula. that goes Behind into the calculating. Not, not, not on just one side but on two. Well, he had to make sure he gave you the visual <laughs> that went along with the formula. <laughs> and thank you for the Dr. short Jaffers. amount of PowerPoint slides. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Yeah. <laughs> well, get it down to 10. Do you, need, do you need a microphone? So no, I think it's, we're talking right through okay. here. So I think, okay. Well, this is good morning. Um, we're um, a pleasure is mine to be with Dr. Montgomery this morning uh, to present the four-year graduation rate. Uh, and again, this simple metric is a simple fraction. You know, we're talking about a four-year rate. And we want to quantify the number of students that actually complete um, our graduation requirements in four years. So the numerator is composed of all those students in the cohort, which we say cohort X, which is school year 2017-18, who graduate in four years or less. And we divide that by the, the sort of the, the denominator, which is the, um, the, the total number of first time ninth graders uh, that we see. And, that, and really it's, it's 2018 minus three, so it's the school year 2014-15 that we quantify. We subtract all the transfers out and we add all the transfers in. Uh, and then in the next slide, we can see the... Um, <laughs> the visual? Yeah, this is the visual. So it's multiple <laughs> representations <laughs> and that's what we want to do. So For this the is... non-math people. Exactly right. So. <laughs> I was much more comfortable with this visual. Same here. You know, yeah, I like, oh, I get it. <laughs> out and in and yes. Yeah. 
yeah. So, so that's so it. So the, it's the same thing uh, stated uh, uh, repetitiously on, on the previous slide. So we have the 2014 ninth grade first time. Subtract out the transfers out. Subtract or add in the transfers in, and we end up with the, compiling the uh, the number of students that graduate by the summer of 2018. So here's the big reveal. Um, our on-time graduation rate for the class of 2018 was 94.51%. And as you can see from this chart, we be where we began collecting the data 2011, we started to 83.66, and we have trended up um, since then quite significantly. Had a couple of dips in the last couple of years, but when you're talking about a graduation rate this high, we really are talking about you know individual students and you're going to get to see that as we go into the individual schools and the slides and just the number of kids at each that make up each cohort that we actually didn't get across the line um, but for this number um, we are for we are number one we're very pleased with our number being 94.51 percent highest it's ever been but also it in the tri-county area looking at the southern maryland region we were number one in the tri-county area not to say anything against any of the other county schools but we're pretty proud that we beat all three of the of all three of um, charles and calvert and then on top of that we are third in the state so this number put us third in the state, only behind Queen Anne's County and Carroll County. So uh, we consider that pretty accomplished as well. Um, the Maryland graduation rate is 87.6%, yes. yes, 87.67%. So needless to say, we well above, well above that. So before we, we move on to the next slides, I'd like you to just consider, we look at short-term and long-term trends, right? So the short-term trend would be everything from 216, I should say 2016 to 2018. So that's our short-term trend that I'd like you to look at. And then we want to look at the longer-term trend, which is 2011 to 2018. And I guess I always look for higher highs and higher lows. Are our lows higher, you know, now our, as we move through the slides, should our lows be higher than the, the previous lows? And, and that's always a really positive trend. And as you can see, the long-term trend is, is definitely sloping up positively. Lower lows um, have been sort of erased. So we're looking at uh, lower low, uh, the, the lower right to the upper, uh, lower left to the upper right, we want to see that trending higher. And especially in the last two years, 2016 to 2018, we definitely are trending in the right direction. So. Again, the same idea of lower, uh, of higher lows. We can see that, uh, you know, last year in 17, we took a bit of a, uh, a dip in economically disadvantaged students, uh, we, and we like to see, you know, as as, uh, as Dr. Montgomery talked about, we uh, we don't want to get too riled up with either the the improvements or the decline or the regression. We want to make sure that we have that trend intact over time, and we can clearly see that over time, long term and short term. We have this, um, you know, we have that trend intact for our economically disadvantaged students. 88.3%. Yes. Uh, as we move forward again, um, you know, once again, African American, uh, just like in the slide before, this is the highest uh, recorded graduation um, number that we have uh, for, for this particular cohort. And again, we can see that the long term trend is intact. The short term trend certainly uh, was reversed from last year to this year. And again, on highest recorded. African American graduation rate uh, that we have in St. Mary's County, 92.14%. How does that compare with the state? Uh, they have not released the disaggregated numbers just yet, um, but we do know we have the aggregate. Uh, and once we get all that information, we'll be able to break that down accordingly. So. I'd like to see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looking at each school, um, if you take a look at Choptecon High School, and um, the blue line represents our black students, the, the um, red line represents our white students, and uh, the gray line represents our free and reduced meal students. And then we have the chart on the left, which kind of gives you, and the reason for this chart is to tell you the exact number of students that you're talking about at each site for each, each individual disaggregated group. So, um, at Chopticon High School, they had a little bit of a dip with their uh, white students as well as with their African American students from last year. But when looking at the African American students, 33, there were 33 African American students in this class of 2018 cohort, and we graduated 28 out of 33 percent of them. Had we graduated four more of those students, there would not be a gap between white students and, and black students graduating at Chopticon High School. 
Had we gotten all five, of course, we'd be at 100%. And, and you can look at the same thing with the, with the numbers of the white students, the free and reduced meals kids. So there were eight free and reduced meals kids that we did not get across the line and special education. Um, all of these, the, we, we talk about these things because every, the principal, Kim Summers at the school, the counselor, the teachers, they are all going to know who these students are. It's such a small group. And as Dr. Jaffers likes to say, we are at the point where we're looking at the last five pounds. You know, so we, we have fluctuations in our numbers sometimes when you get up that high because you are talking about a very small number of students that we're not getting across the line. So we work very hard to work with those students and, and develop individual plans for them. So question. overall, Choptecon High School, 94.75%. All right, a question for the math man. So what is the difference in the cohort numbers between 2017 and 2018? Like, I mean, at each of the schools, is it a large variance or is it fairly steady? It's pretty, it's pretty normalized and okay. standardized, yes, there's not much Because variance. if it was, then you'd probably adjust it down for us, wouldn't you? Very good point. <laughs> yeah, and we, we find that the enrollment characteristics at all of our schools have remained very consistent over the last 10 right, years. Right, but I mean like last year if we had 45 right. students or let's say we had 75 students in farms versus right. this year we're going to hit 68, Absolutely we right. have a lower base so that, right. that adjusts everything. Yep. A lot more variance. So. Okay, that's correct. Yep. That's do you, like if you have a child that's like say in two or three of the cohorts, where do you place them on this? They're in all three. They're all three. Yeah, all three. So if you have a special education economically disadvantaged African-American student, they're actually in the data three times. Mm -hmm. okay. So next, Leonardtown High School, and their overall graduation rate was 97.16%, highest ever at the school. And um, you can see the number of students, the end size for each subgroup here, but I think the important thing to note on this chart is that our African-American students actually graduated at a higher rate than our white students at Leonardtown High School. So our white students graduated at a rate of 96.77% and our African-American at 97.87%. So um, there is not a gap and actually, at, there's not a gap at Leonardtown High School at all. So um, that's pretty good and again, you're looking at one student out of 47. We graduated 46 out of 47 African American students, 330 out of 341 economically disadvantaged, um, white students, I'm sorry, and 52 out of 56 free and reduced meals, 22 out of 28 special ed. So good data. And now uh, next, Great Mills High School. And as you can see from this, we have the same situation that we do at Leonardtown High School. Um, not only do we have no gap with our African American students and our white students in their graduation rates. Our African American students were at 91.95% and our white students were at 91.19% at Great Mills High School. Overall at Great Mills, 91.32%. So what do we do? Overall supporting mechanisms. Um, we have to look at it this way. We have great people and we have great programs. And the great people that we have in our system, we would not have we would not have the great programs working if we didn't have the great people implementing those programs. And when I talk about the great people, I'm talking about not the principals, the administrative team, the counselors, the teachers, everybody, and also our parent community. Our parent community is very involved and, and it gets a lot of credit for this number as well. We have Unify, and that's a great platform that allows us to individually monitor student data, to develop intervention plan so we can get right in and you know we get to look at and analyze everything that we do and we do a whole lot of analyzing don't we Dr. Jaffers a whole lot of analyzing of our data and looking at um, where our kids are and what they need to do to reach next steps um, so that's been great and grade recovery opportunities I've got to give a great deal of credit all of the credit for this with our teachers and our counselors, because at the grade, with the grade recovery options and all of the online earning, uh, online learning options that we have, we're getting ready to sunset Apex and uh, ha go move into Edgenuity for the next school year. But our online opportunities have just been uh, wonderful for our teachers to use, and they identify. As soon as a student does not do well on an exam, a project, an assignment, whatever it is, 
the teacher can get right in there and provide other opportunities for those students to make up that grade so that before we get to the end of the quarter, they aren't faced with a failing grade. And then when if they do get to the end of the quarter, then we have our counselors that are getting in there checking all the uh, D and F data for all of our students and developing plans and seeing what kind of recovery options that we can get for those students so that by the time we get to the end of the school year, we don't have a large number of kids that have o that have not been already intervened, we've not already intervened with, to try to get them um, across the line. So that's that's been really wonderful. We have a, a pretty clear, focused, system-wide professional development plan, and of course, you know all of the things that, that we've shown you here. We've done a unified presentation, we've done a goal book presentation, we've done a UDL presentation, and we definitely provide all those things at the system level. But more importantly, the principals go back and they provide the same types of opportunities for their staff. So we are constantly going into the schools to provide that professional development and for the principals to get in there and have their teachers have that type of professional development. So I feel like we have that whole systematic look at things. Um, you know about our individualized programs. You, you had a presentation about evening high school and about fairly just last, last board meeting. Those two programs have just been um, instrumental with our, in, in getting us where we are right now. Um, last year, Evening High School, first time we brought it back in a long time. Um, I don't remember what year, 2011 maybe is first time, last time we had it. But um, Evening High School, last year we gave Mr. Dothard and Ms. Johnson, who were the two co-leaders down there, we gave them 25 seniors um, some, somewhere between March and the end of the school year saying we need you know we want these seniors to graduate you know do everything you can to work with these seniors and out of those 25 kids 21 out of 24 got to walk with their class at graduation so he 21 out of 25 right there got to got to walk across the stage with their classmates and then we got an additional three students over the summer so you know they kept working all summer long and bringing them back in and we got an additional three students so that that's pretty impressive and you know all the work you've known all the work of fair lead and um, and them giving support to students then we have life skills for our special education students in all of our high schools and working with students on their individualized plans and goals and um, when I say an emphasis on family involvement, it's it's not just it's it's not just you know families coming to a school improvement team meeting. It's just the commitment. We live in a wonderful community that makes the, the parents make education a priority. They get their students to school every day. They 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 participate in their children's education, and that means more that that they're partnering with us than and any program that we could have. It's it's just all about the people. So we are also grateful for the community and for what they do. You know preparing their students at home to come to us and, and work with us so um, and I don't need to say we did not bring the principals out of their buildings today I do not need to talk about the strong instructional leadership that we have at, at all of our schools um, especially right now because we're talking about graduation rate in our high schools but we do have phenomenal leaders in this system and I'm very grateful for every one of them so questions I, I just I have two oh, points I first before oh, you start like I'll go um, back. Maureen, you killed it. Do you, what do you want me to put back up? <laughs> I want you to go to the slide about the uh, farms and the African American graduation rate. Okay. I just, so I want to make a point before okay. we all start with questions and comments. Okay. I'll start um, with farms? Right. So okay. if you look at going back to Dr. Jaffer's point in 2011 about where we were and then in 2014, I think it shows the commitment of the school system and the budget that we have put forward in the last five years that the commitment is to the students and the teachers in the classroom, right? There's not any of these other like crazy programs, you know, everything was focused on what we needed to do in order to get our students to learn, mm -hmm. right? And I think the list that you put on your very last slide I would say the majority of those programs have been put in place within the last two or three last, years. Yes, you know, three to four years. It, it, that, that's the point I want to make. It's like turning the Titanic with a three-inch rudder. I mean, it doesn't right. happen overnight. I mean, we, <laughs> and we I'm have not, to have. Right, I'm not, I mean, I'm not expecting you to. I, I, I'm just saying that. Absolutely it, right. Right. It, it takes like I'm, I'm so glad you brought up that point because we need time to. Sometimes the vision it takes time for, for this to firm to to marinate and, and to bloom and, and percolate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think you're right. So it's a Jeff Jeffers 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 term. Jeffers Serian Jeff 
Yeah. We're marinating and we're percolating. Yeah. Marinating and percolating. <laughs> I mean, Making the coffee. Because I mean if you I mean if you look, you know, like you know, even when, when I came on the board in twenty fourteen we were still at eighty three point three. Mm-hmm. So everything that, that we have voted on yes. and heard about over the last mm-hmm. four years has been support for students, support for students, intervention with students and to just to clarify, the recovery grades does not mean that your previous grade is erased right. <laughs> by oh, any no. means. No. It no. is still included. So you yes. bomb a test, that that bomb score is still on there. We are not removing grades or or adjusting grades or anything like that. It's about the learning. Right. It's about the learning. Right. So as we go forward, that's that was just my point. Everything within the last, you know, four years has has obviously percolated and grown well to get you to this place so yes thank you do you want to see the the african-american well yeah i mean you can can see the same thing there i mean you know look when it started in you know in 2011 13 you had a big jump you know and then where it really skyrocketed was in 14 and then you know you and I'm sure some of that is just based on numbers, too. That's right. And again, the trend is intact. I mean, the long-term right. trend is intact. And then again, we go from big to small. So we take these big cohort groups, and then we're going to differentiate accordingly and drill down to the individual student. Right. Uh, so this is exactly what we do. We, we start big, then we drill down to the individual student. Absolutely correct. So it is a razor focus on getting those kids across the stage. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, I'm done. Okay. Like. <laughs> um, I think you guys put together a really nice presentation. Your data was very nice. I did have one thing that I was curious about, though. Um, why is it that there are only, like, out of your student groups, why are there only two races identified and not, um, well, why don't you cover more of what's in our school? Well, we, we can. Um, that'll be up on, on our report card. We have to report that out. We have more than 10 students of any cohort. Uh, we have to report that out. We, I've been limited to the number of slides and the amount of space. Uh, so, and those desegregated students, You're welcome. some of them don't have enough students to actually right. be a reporting size. Okay, that was my other question. We need yeah. 10 students yeah. in each, report, in each yeah. cohort. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You answered my question earlier about the, you know, I, like I said, putting more than, uh, putting a student in more than one area. So, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Dr. Jeffers, uh, you mentioned earlier norm, data normalization. Yes. A uh, question I have, uh, like you have the categories, black or African American, white, and you have free and reduced meals and special educations. Is free and reduced meals and special eds, there may or may not be different races in those that's categories. That's, Did you that's address correct. that? That's correct. I mean, yeah, that's poverty, poverty doesn't know race. Yeah, we, we don't know. That's why Unify is so powerful, because we can disaggregate with economically disadvantaged students. Absolutely correct. So, yeah, so there, there could be white, two or more races, African American, uh, Asian, uh, American Indian, et cetera, in that free and reduced economically disadvantaged cohort. Correct. Yeah, so then these curves are not real comparable at times, then, right? Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I, I think I think Dr. Smith mentioned this before. The the trends, the trend, and really the numbers don't change quite quite that drastically from one year to the next. Maybe Ms. Bailey said that um, the numbers for economically disadvantaged are pretty uh, sort of intact. However, we have seen since the recession set in a few years ago, we we've seen a number of students, the economically disadvantaged students certainly has increased in our county much more than, than we had seen earlier in, in late 2009, 2010, et cetera. So, 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 the, so that cohort has actually grown in size uh, right. probably more significantly proportional uh, over the time than any other cohort that we have in our system. And, and, and it, it may be uh, environmentally more affecting. True. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's true. So I, I guess what I'm saying is not apples and apples. I mean, for the most part, I would say that it is because there's not drastic changes year in and year out. Um, It is predicated on a self-report where uh, individual families have to say, hey, we would like to participate in the free and reduced lunch program. So it is self-report. So in that regard, it isn't as black and white, let's say, uh, Mm -hmm. as ethnicity or as race. Um, So uh, I would say the only thing that would be sort of variance year in and year out is is the uh, the, um, propensity to self-report right. households so 
and, and, and I forgot to mention this. I think Maureen asked, asked Maureen to mention this, but she forgot, so I'll remind her. Um, <laughs> the, the, the idea here is that we, we're only capturing the four-year data. So mm -hmm. we have students that have, like special education students may have right. an right. extra year or they have ESSA is predicated not on That's four right. years, it's predicated on five years. Right. But at the end of it, I don't think, you know, and we, and we keep that measurement, and that measurement is incrementally yes. higher than all of these because we never give up on any student. That, but the measured mark that we should evaluate ourselves on is how well do we meet the mission and the mission is a child enters in ninth grade and they leave four years later with uh with a degree that's meaningful and transferable and appropriate for the next stage in their life and so if you go back to the the one slide the big slide that's in there twice the it's, it's in there twice what the over the, the overall the overall trend data for the whole system it's not no, there you go. We, we, we took it. This, wait, oh, you took this, it out for that one, but we wait. didn't. We ours is still in. Yeah, Which we is have oh. both. We have both presentations oh, loaded. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that really the truest picture is going to be this big is of all all students, and then when you disaggregate it out, each each identifying group smaller and smaller and smaller, you're going to see greater variance as you go through mm -hmm. because there's more volatility in a smaller group. So when you're looking at this, you're looking at 1,151 students, I believe. Um, when you take a look at like Chopscott High School and you're looking at 32, you know that becomes a lot more. It, it you know it, it totally it totally depends sure. um, on the way that looks. The increase that we see in all of the the individual student groups and specifically the fact that there is no gap at Leonardtown High School and at Great Mills High School and Great Mills in particular, that's a testament to your decision board to allow us to take funds last year and move them mid-year to stand up evening high school. 21 students when you're in 90, the difference between 93.93 and 94.51 is gonna be about those 21 students. And those 21 students are gonna be students that represent the most at-risk student groups. So that's going to be your economically disadvantaged. That's the first indicator of risk. If you're economically disadvantaged, there's a higher likelihood that you will not graduate on time. Race and ethnicity with African Americans. African Americans, historically, there's been a gap with our student, with our student groups. And then finally, special education. So quite often, if you went down to evening high school, you would find that they were economically disadvantaged African American students who may be, really, be, may be receiving special ed services. And that's made the difference. So. Um, Certainly applaud all of the work that's going on in the school, but thank you to all of you for recognizing its importance and supporting it because the proof's in the pudding. That's some great, delicious pudding. And don't have that be the quote. <laughs> no. Smith says delicious pudding. Um, that, that, that really is. That small, a, a decision like that can raise or lower a rate when you get to that to that level and and that really is a testament to you know your your decision making and support for the work of really qualified um, people I, I don't want to start another metric but really <laughs> the the fact that dr. Smith said they don't graduate in five four years but maybe five years maybe they're, they're working or something um, that may be, to me, it might be a great impact. In other words, the numbers may be a lot higher. Yep, and we do capture that data. We, we have to report that. Do yeah. Yeah. I don't want to hear about it, but I just. <laughs> <laughs> I think you don't okay. want another presentation. I think you can I go onto the MSD website and find <laughs> that. I think it's on the MD report, report card reports out three year graduation rate, four year graduation, and five year graduation rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our special education students can go until 21. Correct. Mm -hmm. And they represent um, a little over 10% of our population. So 10% of our population, one out of 10 students is identified as special education, and they may receive services up to the age of 21. So you, you could argue that, you know, from, uh, from grade 9 uh, to tw age 21, uh, your rates are even higher. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay. That's all I got. I already said my piece. It's Mary's turn. <laughs> I want to thank you um, and congratulate everyone in the school system, everyone, for helping us with the graduation rate. It's the teachers in the classroom. It's the food services people. Mm -hmm. It's transportation to get the students there and food services. They make sure students have healthy and nutritious meals. They encourage them to eat breakfast. They encourage healthy um, lifestyle. The nurses, 
building service workers, everybody in the system is on board with helping, helping the students to graduate. And I see that when I visit schools, everybody is helping. And I'm thankful for Evening High School. And Dr. Smith, that might be one of your legacies that you're getting students over the line to graduate and we have to make sure we continue to provide resources for that program. Um, because there are many students who are struggling, not only economically, but they may have social, emotional problems and family problems that they need to have a smaller setting. Not all students work well in a large uh, high school with 1,600 to 1,800 students, just as we may not work, um, work well working for a large corporation. We may do better working in a smaller organization. So it's not just one thing, it's many things that help our students to graduate. I'm thankful for the hard work that went into making us number one in the Southern Maryland region and number three in the state of Maryland. So that's something we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. And we just have to continue. You say the, the, the ship is turning <laughs> and we have to make sure that it continues to go in the right direction. So next year, our graduation rate will be even higher. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought about some students, it may take them five years to graduate. Not all students are able to do it in four years, but many can do it successfully in five years. So I was wondering about the data. Do you track it? The ones, what would the rate be if st for students who graduate in five years? They are students who drop out and get their GED for a number of reasons. And um, some students, like you say, do it in the summer, but those are not counted because it's a four-year cohort rate. So the numbers are better than what they really are, but that's not the standard, and we have to keep raising the bar, and our students will rise to that standard. So thank you for providing the data. I know you love that, and uh, Ms. Montgomery, and I thank this board for trying to help all students graduate on time. We are committed to that by so many different means. Even as the student came with males in the classroom in elementary, that's something that this board say is a priority. We're trying to get more male role models, students to eat healthy meals, even in high school, qualified teachers, mentoring programs. So we have so many things that we're doing that a lot of times the citizens don't know about it, what we're doing, because mm -hmm. we're so busy working, working, working. So thank you so much. Well, I'm thinking that um, above the fold front page story about graduation rate and being third in the state and being uh, first in the tri-county area sounds like a really excellent idea for a story. <laughs> 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 Just a suggestion. Okay. Uh, Go so those, um, the students who uh, complete over the summer, are they included as part they of the four-year? Oh, they are. Yeah. Okay. That's good. We don't, we don't submit our final file on the kids until September. Right. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, you, you read all kinds of headlines about um, ways that school systems uh, raise their graduation rates. I'm proud of the fact that um, we have great accountability here. We provide the tools that are needed, um, and and we follow up. Um, but I have to give kudos to the superintendent and to your entire senior team, um, to, through through the entire administrative team, because really you are the ones who research and identify the programs that you bring to us to say this is what we, in our professional judgment, believe is um, the way to go to help these students, um, and and that I think has been integral in us achieving, um, and I, I say the, the greater us achieving uh, the kind of results that you are showing us here. Um, so kudos to all. I, I would like you to go to the Great Mills slide, if you would, please. Um, and I, I, I really want a shout out to Dr. Heibel and to all the staff there, because if you look um, at the numbers across the bottom, you look at the numbers for 2017 as well as 2018, and you see that the gap is gone mm -hmm. in those both those years. And you can go back um, to 2014, there was no gap there either. 
Um, and so congratulations, truly, because uh, the work that's being done there especially, I know it's being mirrored at, at the other high schools, <clears throat> but I think here we really see um, what can be done with um, truly committed folks and the tools and the multitude of tools that they have at their disposal. And um, so congratulations to all. And I, I no pressure, but I hope that, um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that next year um, that uh, Leonardtown is certainly a repeater and that Great Mills is as well. And I look forward to seeing Chopticons. I think that the different programs that Mrs. Summers has put in place uh, especially with the capturing kids' hearts, um, I think is going to pay dividends that we will see um, in these numbers in the very near future. We can all lose five pounds. <laughs> exactly. It's the last five pounds. <laughs> the last five. The last five pounds. I'll let you know when I get to the last five. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the last five are in there someplace. They're just buried over the other 20. Exactly. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Ms. McCord. Safe Good travels, Dr. Montgomery. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, text us when you land. Uh, I will. I will. Thank you. When you land in the place you're supposed right, to be. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make that <laughs> distinction. We took you somewhere. You just didn't like where we took you. <laughs> it has happened. <laughs> yes, it has. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this information isn't quite as exciting as 94.51 percent. <laughs> oh, sure I assure you, it is, it is just money. as I mean, exciting I as money, but yes. We wouldn't be at 94 point whatever if we didn't have money. So right. there you go. That's right. So your adopted budget was at 220.4 million dollars. Of that, we've received 157.1 million dollars in revenues year to date through uh, February, representing 71.27 percent. On the expenditure side, our year end, our current encumbrance has outstanding total $84.8 million. Year to date, encumbrances and expenditures total $210 million, with a remaining available balance at this point of 10.4742, representing 95.27% of our budget. Are there any questions? No questions, thank you. No, thank you. No question. Um, I asked um, Mrs. McCourt the question about um, if you look at the group health insurance and you look at the fact that um, we're only in mid-March and yet uh, we have only an available balance in that um, uh, active employee health care line of just shy of $84,000. Um, so would you um, share sure. with that about that? So we also have an encumbrance in that particular line of $7.9 million to get us through the remainder of the year. Um, so the $83,000 represents just our budgetary balance. Um, I'd like to also point out that in the retiree health line, we have $326,000 available. So should we need to, we can certainly shift funds between the two accounts. On a monthly basis, CareFirst also reports back to us exactly where we stand if we were to settle today. And as of the end of January, we're at $100,000 to the good on their books. Um, additionally, what's not taken into consideration here is our final settlement, which would include our refund um, of any rebates. So we're in a good position on that. I there, are, just, there aren't concerns, but that was an excellent question. Thank I, you. It just you know, something I like to keep track of. So do I. Thank you. <laughs> Very closely. Yes, we do. <laughs> Any additional questions? And then the only other thing that I noted was um, if you look at the budget transfer summary sheet, um, the 11th of February, um, we've moved a, a significant amount of money um, from uh, various maintenance accounts um, over to um, over to meet maintenance requirements. Um, and I was told that a lot of that has to do with the, um, some significant uh, needs in HVAC boilers and so forth yes. um, that, um, that occurred. And it just, um, I, I understand that at this point in time, you, it's, um, it's easy for you to understand based on experience um, where we are with a variety of accounts and use that 
to cover where needed. Um, it's just that um, usually we're not moving almost $200,000 from a variety of accounts. Um, and so I wanted to better understand where that was all coming from. So I appreciate, Dr. Walker, the um, additional information you provided. Um, yes, ma'am. Each year we, we do our best to predict budget alignment based on previous, based on history and our anticipated expenditures and replacements. This year we had several emergency issues, mostly related to HVAC, um, but also a couple other areas that that we had to, to spend money on that was unexpected. So as we've gone through the year, we've tried to make that up in other ways, and it's, uh, it's at a point now in the budget year where we felt like it was appropriate to move the money we knew what we could and couldn't do for the rest of the year and, and realign the funds to account for those expenditures. I, I truly appreciate these budget transfer summary sheets that you um, are including. Um, it helps. Uh, I just don't always necessarily make the connection between items that have been brought forward for us to have to vote on or to be informed about and then the specific dollar amount that's here. So um, I appreciate the additional information you provided. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I wanted to okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Anyone have anything else? Um, when I gave my board report, my computer was on the blink, and I was talking about uh, Benjamin Banneker Elementary School. Uh, I had to start your engine program, which was sponsored by uh, the school system food and nutrition services, where they encourage healthy eating, especially bre breakfast, to get the student's brain engaged. And uh, I want to thank these community members who bought their race cars and sports cars to the school for the students so they can make a connection with uh, how you fuel your car and how you f fuel your body if you want to have uh, the maximum um, performance. So I want to thank Cindy Gilligan who bought her orange and white Camaro sports muscle car to school. Mm -hmm. Gary Mormon, who bought his son's 1973 Red Plymouth Barracuda, better known as a cooter. And Mr. Mormon's son was not able to come because he's in training to be a Maryland State Trooper who will graduate in July. But I want to thank his father for stepping in and bringing the car. And then David Gates, who is a race car driver, bought in his 421 Mustang. So as the students got off the bus, the cars were in the parking lot. They were able to see uh, the engine, and some of them got inside the car to take a look at it, and they were very impressed what food services does. So it goes back to say everyone in the school system is invested in making sure all students obtain their maximum potential so that they can graduate on time. So it's everybody, food services, and um, I ate lunch there, I mean, excuse me, breakfast. And school breakfast start, the students off on the right foot, and research has proven that when you eat a school breakfast, it increases academic performance. It increases concentration, comprehension, attention, and alertness. It promotes higher atten attendance rate, because you know breakfast is gonna be there and people love to eat, especially mm -hmm. students. It promotes better learning, better participation in the classroom, a better attitude, it reduces <laughs> discipline issues, it diminishes behavior problems, and decreases tardiness and absenteeism. And I want to thank Megan Doran, the Director of Food and Nutrition Services, Caitlin Russell, the Food and Nutrition Specialist, Mike Jones, and Sherry Castanas, Food Services Coordinator. In addition to the program manager, the driver, the warehouse manager, and the secretary, and everyone who made that program successful. It was a lot of fun. So thanks to them. Thank you. Okay. That's it. All right. The next board meeting will be on March 27th at 6 p.m. And we are adjourned. Sorry.